Hello, folks, and thank you for joining me. I had to look at the side of the screen to see if it was blinking there. Okay, so um, this is the 27th reading or book read on the Free Masonic Knowledge channel here. Um, this is uh, from the Occult Review, March 1924. Notes of the month. I chose this one here next um, thought I would get to a couple more of these if I can find time here and um, this one in particular has to do with uh, kind of rev relevant uh, subject matter as the last couple of three Zephpod uh, subjects uh, kind of what uh, just kind of goes hand in hand this is some uh, knowledge from the Freemasonic angle and uh, concerning cosmic consciousness uh, contributed by W.L. Wilmshurst, which is a uh, very well-known Freemasonic writer, author, contributor. And uh, it is rather to be assumed that a man who writes about cosmic consciousness has undergone the experience in his own person. Otherwise, what should lead to his writing on so strange and so abnormal an experience? We are not, however, entitled to assume that the individual who has had the experience in question is necessarily capable of writing a good book or even of writing convincingly on the subject. Perhaps in a certain sense the outsider who has had no such experience can write more dispassionately and therefore with less bias on the nature of this strange phenomenon. The first edition of Dr. Buck's Cosmic Consciousness, uh, i.e. Cosmic Consciousness, a study in the evolution of the human mind by Richard Maurice Buck, MD, American Book Supply Company, etc., etc., was published long ago as 1901. The book has been out of print for some time, and the present edition has been corrected and entirely reset throughout. It has, I believe, the outstanding merit of being, whatever its defects, the only comprehensive work on the subject in existence. Dr. Book re, uh, re describes his own sensations when, at the beginning of his 36th year, he met with this experience, as this incident is the foundation stone of the work in question and led to an entire change in the author's whole mental and spiritual attitude it is well to give an account of it in his own words it will be noted that though the account is his own he writes of himself in the third person it was in the early spring at the beginning of his 36th year he and two friends had spent the evening reading wordsworth shelley keats browning and especially whitman they parted at midnight and he had a long drive in a hansom and it was an English city, and uh, uh, his mind, deeply under the influence of the ideas, images, and emotions called up by the reading and talk of that evening, was calm and peaceful. He was in a state of quiet, almost passive enjoyment all at once, without warning of any kind. He found himself wrapped around as if it were by a flame-colored cloud. For an instant he thought of fire, some sudden conflagration in the great city. The next he knew that their light was within himself. Directly afterwards came upon him a sense of ex exaltation, of immense joyness accompanied, or immediately followed by an intellectual illumination quite possible to describe. Into his brain streamed one momentary lightning flash of Brahmic splendor, which has ne ever since lightened his life. Upon his heart fell one drop of Brahmic bliss, leaving thenceforward for always an aftertaste of heaven. Among other things, he did not come to believe. He saw and knew that the cosmos is not dead matter but a living presence, and the soul of man is immortal, and that the universe is so built and ordered that without any pre-adventure all things work together, uh, or per-adventure, all things work, to, work together for the good of each and all, and that the foundation principle of the world is what we call love, and that the happiness of every one is, in the long run, absolutely certain. He claims that he learned more within a few seconds during which the illumination lasted than in previous months or even years of study, and that he learned much that no study could ever have taught. And back, uh, basically, it's like a download from what uh, he's describing the same thing. It's 
people have it in their own experiences when you come across that experience if you do some people don't some people make it all through their life and unfortunately never reach that uh, point uh, but my, uh, my experience in the, that part of it was like a download it's literally like a download you're just all of a sudden uh, instantaneously filled with all this amazing information uh, part of my true awakening back in 93 94 I had a similar experience as that um, this experience has that has altered in this and other similar cases the whole tenor of the percipient's outlook on life appears in its purer form to have certain main characteristics the person affected realizes as never before the oneness of the universe he sees himself as part and parcel of this unity which he senses as the expression of a single conscious life and that with that oneness comes that uh, completeness when you when you touch that oneness you feel that completeness and that complete bliss in your soul at least it was for me and it was like that's when you can't help but love everything it's it's an incredible experience um, he sees himself as part and parcel of this unity which he senses as expression of a single conscious life at the moment of the experience the re realization of the consciousness of the separateness of the ego and the non-ego the knower and the known entirely disappears the man who has once had it is no longer able to feel a shadow of doubt as to human human immortality he knows it with a certainty that no argument or evidence can strengthen or shake jesus presumably had this experience on the mountain transfiguration and the buddha writes over and over again as if he was familiar with it as for instance when he tells us uh, how he attained enlightenment under the bodhi tree among earlier mystics who have had kindred experiences in the case of st paul is probably the most familiar to readers though we should hardly be justified in affirming that either of the two experiences recorded of him that they were certainly instances of what might strictly be termed cosmic consciousness though perhaps the latter one to which he alludes in a very cryptic manner may have been the more definite def definitively of this nature uh, the first of these it will be remembered was on the road to damascus when he was converted to christianity and had a vision of the christ and saw a great light which had any effect of blinding him for some days afterwards the other was many years later when he was caught up into the third heaven and heard as he says unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter the scene of this great light is one of the phenomena which reoccur or recur again and again in these records and seems to show that the st paul's first experience was at least akin to another phenomena of the kind we should perhaps associate with these experiences what has been termed the beautic vision or which comes uh, which comes to the religious devotee rather than to the mystical philosopher and should I would submit be regarded as a more personal phase of the same experience it may be that the beautic vision in or is in the nature of realization of the higher self or the Christ in man while cosmic consciousness is in the nature of an intuitive perception of the eminence of the deity in all manifested life and the essential oneness of the universal consciousness according as the mind of the percipient is attuned by his past life and spiritual outlook so does he attain to either one form of the experience or the other certainly the most noteworthy records in early days outside those which may be set down as of a specifically religious character are those recorded of the great mystical philosopher Plotinus or Plotinus Plotinus of uh, or plot ten, you know there's probably i don't know i'm probably pronouncing it wrong but hey what's new <laughs> of whose experiences in the matter there is no suspicion of doubt plotinus was born a.d 204 and died approximately at the age of 70 his philosophic training and ascetic life rendered him peculiarly favorable subject for such an experience his ideas as to the true inwardness of the cosmic scheme are beautifully expressed in the following passage 
There is a raying out of all orders of existence, an eternal emanation from the ineffable one. And there is again a returning impulse, drawing all upwards and inwards towards the center from whence all came. Love, as Plato in the banquet beautifully says, is child of poverty and plenty. In an amorous quest of the soul after the good lies the painful sense of fall and deprivation. But love, that or that love is blessing, is salvation is our guardian genius without it the centrifugal law would overpower us and sweep our souls out far from their source towards the cold extremities of the material and the manifold the wise man recognizes or the wise man recognizes the idea of the good within him this he develops by withdrawal into the place of his soul he who does not understand how the soul contains the beautiful within itself seeks to realize beauty without by laborious production his aim should rather be to concentrate and simplify and so to expand his being instead of going out into the manifold to forsake it for the one and though so to float upwards towards the divine fount of whose a being whose stream flows within him he asks how can we know the infinite and replies that it cannot be known by reason but only by a faculty superior to this which is attained by entering into a state in which man has his finite sense no longer and in which the divine essence is communicated to him this he says is ecstasy and clearly by this expression and i wouldn't call it ecstasy i call it bliss uh, ecstasy which really re mean uh, which really means standing outside of oneself uh Plantinus is referring to the phenomenon of cosmic consciousness for he adds when you thus cease to be finite you become one with the infinite he also observes that this sublime condition is not of permanent duration and it is only now and then that it can be enjoyed or experienced i myself he says have realized it but three times as yet he tells us that all tends to purify and elevate the mind uh, all that tends to purify and elevate the mind sorry will assist us in this attainment and will facilitate the approach and reoccurrence of these happy intervals um, Plotinus offers a philosophical justification for such experiences. External objects, he tells us, present us only with appearances. The problem of true knowledge, on the other hand, deals with the idea of reality uh, that exists behind these appearances. It follows, therefore, that the religion of truth is not to be investigated as a thing external to us, and so only imperfectly known rather it is within us truth therefore he maintains is not the agreement or uh, of our apprehension of an external object of with the object itself but it is the agreement of the mind with itself hence <clears throat> he contends knowledge has three degrees opinions science and illumination the instruments of the first is sense the, the second is dialect and of the third is intuition this third is the absolute knowledge founded on the identity of the mind knowing with the object known ah sorry i had to take a drink there man i'm so getting dried out on that one <laughs> Uh, we have little evidence bearing on this phenomenon between the post-classical times of Plotinus and the later Middle Ages. In these times, however, there are many noteworthy experiences recorded with greater or less historical truth of the Catholic saints of that period, uh, conspicuous among whom may be named John Yepes, more commonly known as St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa, both of whose lives date as recently as the 16th century A.D. St. John of the Cross was born 1542 and died in 1591. At the age of 21, he adopted a religious habit of the Carmelite friars. 
1578, he was in prison for some months for certain practices of a kind which were regarded by the ecclesiastical authorities as unorthodox. And it was during this period, at the age of 36, that he had a mysterious psychic experience which is identified by Dr. Buck with the phenomenon of cosmic consciousness, though it must be admitted that the evidence with regard to its specific character is not altogether conclusive. His biographer, David Lewis, gives the account of it as follows. His cell became filled with light seen by the bodily eye. One night the friar who kept him went as usual to see that his prisoner was safe and witnessed the heavenly light in which the cell was flooded. He did not stop to consider it, but hurried to the friar, thinking that some one in the house had keys to open the doors of the prison. The prior, with two members of the order, went at once to the prison, but on his entering the room through which the prison had which the prison was approached, the light vanished. The friar, however, entered the cell, and finding it dark, opened the lantern with which he had provided himself, and asked the prisoner who had given him the light. St. John answered him, and it said no one in the house had done so, and that no one could do it, and that there was neither candle nor lamp in the cell. The prior made no reply and went away, thinking that the gaoler, gaoler, or the jailer, whatever, had made a mistake. St. John at a later time told one of his brethren that the heavenly light which God so mercifully has sent him lasted the night through, and that it filled his soul with joy and made the night pass away as if it were but a moment. When his imprisonment was drawing to his close, and he heard our Lord say to him, as it were out of the soft light that was around him, John, I am here, be not afraid, I will set thee free. And a few moments later, while making his escape from the prison of the monastery, he it is said that he had a repetition of the experience as follows. He saw a wonderful light out of which came a voice, Follow me. He followed, and the light moved before him towards the wall, which was on the bank, and then, he knew not how, he found himself on the summit of it without effort or fatigue. He descended into the street, and then the light vanished. So brilliant was it that for two or three days afterwards, as so he confessed, at a later time his eyes were weak, as if he had been looking at the sun in his strength. Elsewhere, St. John of the Cross refers to his own spiritual experiences in the language which suggests that these were of a similar character to those already recorded, but his language is vague and deliberately so, as he says that his description of his experience relates to matters so interior and spiritual as to baffle the powers of language and that's true. All I say, he continues, falls far short of that which passes in its intimate union of powers of the soul with God. I stood enraptured in ecstasy beside myself, and in every sense no sense remained. My spirit was endowed with understanding, understanding not, all knowledge transcending. He who really ascends so high annihilate himself and all his previous knowledge seems ever less and less. And that is a very true statement. St. Teresa's mystical experiences, as is well known, were legion. They included the stigmata, the imprint of the five wounds, the crucifixion, uh, levitation, clairvoyance, clairaudience, etc. She too had experience which she terms the orison of union, which corresponds closely by its description to the cosmic consciousness. Okay, and uh, in this orison of union, says Saint Teresa, the soul is fully awake as it regards God, but wholly asleep as it regards things of this world. In respect of herself, during the short time the union lasts, she is, as it were, deprived of every feeling, and even if she would, she could not think of any single thing. Thus she needs to employ no artists in order to assist the use of her understanding. In short, she is utterly dead to the things of the world and lives solely in God. Thus does God 
when he raises the soul to union with himself, suspend the natural action of all faculties. But this time is always short, and it seems even shorter than it is. God establishes himself in the interior of his, this soul in such a way that when she returns to herself, it is wholly impossible for her to doubt that she has been in God and God in her. This truth remains so strongly impressed on her that even though many years should pass without the condition returning, she can neither forget the favor she received nor doubt of its reality. If you ask how it is possible that the soul can see and understand that she has been in God, since during the union she has neither sight nor understanding, I reply that she does not see it then, but that she sees it clearly later after she has returned to herself, not by any vision, but by the certitude that which abides with her and which God alone can give her. Reverting to the same experience on another occasion, St. Teresa recounts. Ow, oh, I just jammed my finger. Darn, I got a bad pinky finger that uh, just won't heal. Anyway, uh, St. Teresa recounts one day it was granted <clears throat> to her to perceive in one instant how all things are seen and contained in God. I did not, she adds, perceive them in their proper form, and nevertheless the view I had of them was of a sovereign clearness and has remained vividly impressed upon my soul. This view was so subtle and delicate that the understanding could not grasp it. Jacob Bomey is another classic example of this experience. His first illumination occurred with the, in the year 1600. When he was 25 years of age, and he had a further and more vivid experience 10 years later, Martinson describes Bowie's first experience as follows. Sitting one day in his room, his eyes fell upon the burnished pewter dish, which reflected the sunshine with such marvelous splendor that he fell into an inward ecstasy, and it seemed to him that as if he could now look into the principles and deepest foundations of things. He believed that it was only a fancy, and in order to banish it from his mind, he went out upon the green. But here he had remarked that he gazed into the very heart of things, the very herbs and grass, and that actual nature harmonized with what he had inwardly seen. He said nothing to anyone but praise and thank God in silence. Amen. And he continued in the God uh, in the God honest practice of his craft, and he is, was attentive to his domestic affairs and was on terms of goodwill with all men. Of his complete illumination ten years later he says himself. And I pause for a second, put out my cigar, sorry for smoking and reading, but, you know. The gate was open to me that in one quarter of an hour I saw and knew more than if I had been many years together at a university, at which I exceedingly admired and thereupon turned my praise to God for it, for I saw and knew the being of all things, the abyss and the abyss, the external gener or in eternal generation of the holy trinity the descent and the original of the world or the origin that should say of the world and of all creatures through the divine wisdom i knew and saw in myself all the three worlds namely the divine angelical and paradox pader the paradoxical paradoxical <laughs> paradoxical whatever and the dark and the original to, that's the original of the nature to the fire and then number three the external and the visible world being a procreation or external birth from both the eternal and in, internal and spiritual worlds and I saw and knew the whole working essence in the evil and the good and the original and the existence of each of them and likewise how the fruit bearing womb of eternity brought forth so that I not only only did greatly wonder at it, but did also exceedingly rejoice. Of men belonging to our modern world who have had the experience of cosmic consciousness, two only seem to my mind absolutely valid instances. One, excuse me, is Edward Carpenter, the author of Towards Democracy, a work of great breadth and insight with which every reader of this magazine should make himself familiar if he has not already done so.
So remember that, Edward Carpenter, Towards Democracy. And James Alien, the author of From Poverty to Power, As a Man Thinketh, and many other booklets which may be characterized as essays on the spiritual life. Edward Carpenter has himself stated that he had hit this experience and, in fact, inti intimidated, in intimated in, uh, as much in a letter uh, uh, to Dr. Buck himself. And so I really, okay, that word threw me, sorry, intimated, in, intimated. Uh, I really do not feel, he says in this letter, they, they used to talk funny back then. <laughs> I really do not feel, he says in this letter, that I can tell you anything without falsifying and obscuring the matter. I have done my best to write it out to in towards democracy. I had no experience of the physical light in this relation. The perception seems to be one in which all the senses unite into one sense, in which you become the object, but this is an unintelligible mentally spinky. I do not think that the matter can be defined as yet, but I do not know that there is any harm in writing about it. Elsewhere, in Civilization, Its Cause and Cure, he writes more definitively on the matter, or definitely on the matter. Uh, there is in every man a local consciousness connected with his quite external body that we know this is there not also in every man the making of a universal consciousness that there are in us phases of consciousness which transcend the limit of the bodily senses and it is a matter of daily experience that we perceive and know things which are not conveyed to us by the bodily eyes and heard by our body ears is certain that there arise in us waves of consciousness from those around us, from the people and the race to which we belong, is also certain. And notice he's, the race to which we belong, he's talking people, race, okay, not what the establishment has brainwashed everybody to race. You know, they separate race by skin color in the dialectic today, and that's incorrect. We're one race, the human race, okay, period. Um, to which we belong is also certain. And, and if you're sensitive like me, you know exactly what he's talking about. And when I'm in a crowd, uh, I've had to develop through my years, uh, excuse the interlude here, but I, I feel that I, I should share this, I guess. Um, through the years, I've, had, I've learned how to build up walls to protect myself from other people's consciousness because I can hear their thoughts basically and feel their emotions and 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 when I'm in a crowd it can become overwhelming and uh, that's why I don't like crowds too much but I've, I mean I've been in plenty of them in my life believe me you know dozens and dozens of concerts and shows and fairs and you name it just like most people in my you know but uh, it, it it's a challenge so may there and let me continue here so may there not be in us the makings of a perception and knowledge which shall not be relative to this body which is here and now but which shall be good for all time and everywhere does there not exist in truth as we have already hinted an inner illumination of which what we call light in the outer world is the partial expression and manifestation by which we can ultimately see things as they are, beholding all creation, not by any local act of perception, but by a cosmical intuition and prescience, identifying ourselves with what we see. And does there not exist a perfected sense of hearing as of the morning stars singing together and understanding of the words that are spoken all through the universe, the hidden meaning of all things, a profound and far pervading sense of which our ordinary sense of sound is the only first novitiate and intuition. Now, I don't like the way this guy writes at all. I do not like the way he phrases his words and sentences and the way this whole thing, it, it makes it almost unintelligible the way he writes it. 
But anyway, I digress. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Carpenter refers elsewhere to that inner vision which transcends sight as far as sight transcends touch and, and uh, to a consciousness in which the contrast between the ego and the external world and the distinction between subject and object fall away. These are surely the words of one who has himself undergone this experience. Carpenter, however, is careful to warn us that we are not to suppose that people who have had this experience are in any way to be regarded as infallible as to its exact meaning. In any case, many cases indeed, he remarks, the very novelty and strangeness of the experience may give rise to phantasmal trains of deluf delusive speculation. Okay, and, and this is true too. And my experience uh, with this that I'm speaking of uh, happened back in 1993 to 94. That's part of my Soul Quest time period. And it has taken me years to figure out what happened to me and uh, even more years to try to make any sense of it. And I'm still working on it. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, it's... it's um, It provide, with many, many answers come many, many more questions. Let's just say that. In further interpretation of this mystery, he observes that the whole body is only, as it were, one organ of the cosmic consciousness. To attain this latter, one must have the power of knowing oneself separate from the body, of passing into a state of ecstasy, in fact. Without this, cosmic consciousness cannot be experienced. It is perhaps well that Mr. Edward Carpenter has written of the matter so definitely, or definitely, and from such an aloof and personal standpoint as he has done, as those who have experienced the state have, as a rule, been both too reserved and with regard to their spiritual experiences and too defi deficient in the critical faculty to give us anything that would appear to the ordinary mind as a satisfactory explanation of the phenomenon. We have nothing, for instance, in writing from Mr. James Alien, who claims to have had the experience more than once, which would throw any intimate light on how or what he saw and felt in connection with it, though it leaves its trace, as it must ever do, on his own standpoint in life, and on all that he has written. Mr. Alien claimed to have had this experience in the first instance at 24, and an unusually early age, while later on it returned after an interval of ten years in, he, and as he says, in a more permanent form. In three modern poet, uh, in, in three modern poets, Wordsworth, Tennyson, and Walt Whitman's, there are suggestions which point to some experience of the kind, and Walt Whitman, especially in his Leaves of Grass, has expressed in singularly beautiful phraseology the mental attitude which we associate with the transmutation of the individual life by this mystical experience. The lines written by Wordsworth and T on Tintern Abbey, on Tintern Abbey, sorry, in his twenty-ninth year are again singularly apposite uh, as an expression of the mental state to which cosmic consciousness serves as the portal. In these, he speaks of that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and the very weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened, that serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporal frame, or corporeal, you know, frame, uh, and even the motion of our human blood, almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul, while with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy we see into the life of things. Further lines in the same poem suggest the occurrence of an actual personal experience in this connection, and we should perhaps be right if we class this poet, albeit with some hesitancy, along with the others given in these notes as one of those who actually entered into this state of higher consciousness, who have been put en rapport with 
the unity of all created life and have seen with the bodily eye and not in any mere poetical vision the light that never was on land or sea thus he writes once more i have felt a presence that disturbs me with joy of elevated thought a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused whose dwelling is the light of the setting suns and the round ocean and the living air the blue sky and the mind of man a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things all objects of all thought and rolls through all things Tennyson's verse again is steeped in the mysticism and the depth of which the ordinary reader and indeed the critic as well have been too slow to appreciate. The author of Cosmic Consciousness himself speaks of this poet far too depreciatingly and must, I'm afraid, be numbered with those who fail to gauge his true greatness and the inwards of what he wrote. The whole conception of underlying verses on the Holy Grail is steeped in a mystical insight and the thought of the deep reality underlying the entire phantasmagora of the phenomenal world is seldom far absent from the poet's thought. It's a good poem. And the, uh, the following lines from the Holy Grail may be given as an instance, but they are only one example out of many. And I quote again, Let the visions of the night or of the day come as they will, and many a time they come. Until this earth he walks on seems not earth. This light that strikes his eyeball is not light. This air that smites his forehead is not air. But vision, yea, his very hand and foot, in moments when he feels he cannot die, and knows himself no vision to himself, nor the high God a vision, nor that one who rose again ye have seen what ye have seen again in the ancient sage as many readers will recall he relates how revolving in myself the world or the word that is the symbol of myself the mortal limit of the self was loosed and passed into the nameless as a cloud melts into heaven I touched my limbs, and the limbs were strange, not mine, and yet no shade of doubt, but utter clearness and throw loss of self, the gain of such large life as matched with ours, were sun to spark, unshadowable were in words, and uh, themselves but shadows of a shadow world. This is admittedly the record of personal experience and referred to as such in the poet's life by his son, the present Lord Tennyson. Dr. Buck gives many instances of this work of men who, in his view, have experienced cosmic consciousness in some form or another, but by the critical mind many of these can hardly be regarded as legitimate. Among these may be mentioned Mohammed, whose illumination might be defended by some, but who, to my thinking, rather appears to have been written the Koran in much the same way as Madame Blasky wrote Isis Unveiled, whom I should class rather as a natural medium in this respect than as a real illuminant. Dante is again another instance given with regard to whom, however, conclusive evidence is lacking. The Bacon and Shakespeare controversy is introduced rather unfortunately into the present work, <laughs> from which it would be well, and I cannot help thinking that such fantastic and irrelevant controversies were omitted. Several of the instances given in the present notes do not appear at all. No woman is named among the subjects of this experience. I myself as an instance St. Teresa, and among the moderns in this connection, Anna Kingsford, an illuminant from a very different type, should not be overlooked. Probably at the same pre at the, probably at the present time, though Dr. Buck, Buck cites only the uh, Cites only the case of uh, Ramash, Ramakrishna, Ramakrishna, Ramahashma, or Ramahashma. Uh, this experience is more common among the saints and ascetics of India than in any other part of the world. A training which leads, lends itself naturally to the production of such phenomena is a well known yoga discipline, the goal of which is attainment of samadhi and uh, at the state near akin to, if not practically identical with that known in the West as cosmic consciousness. And that's lifting your energy and vibrations through your chakras uh, to reach into the uh, uh, 
database. <laughs> I mean, cosmic consciousness. Um, and Dr. Buck claims that <laughs> the cases of cosmic consciousness are steadily increasing as the world grows older. And that this may well be so, but the instances chosen by him are not unfrequently so capricious, uh, capricious, sorry, uh, <laughs> while other important ones are omitted. And the list he gives in support of his contention will hardly carry conviction, more especially as only one is given from India. In Dr. Buck's opinion, there is a steady development of sentient life from that simple consciousness which is possessed by the higher types of the animal kingdom, onward to the self-consciousness which, together with the use of language, is the differentiating characteristic of mankind, right up to that cosmic consciousness which he holds will be, in eons to come, the heritage of all alike. By that time, it may be supposed, mankind will have developed more spiritual type of body and nervous organization which will permanently be responsive to influences which today reach only the rarest types of humanity in occasional and evanescent flashes. And, uh, might I add, right there on that note, right there is the beginning of, of uh, manipulation. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking about him, but right there, this that, uh, right there, the seeds planted, okay, and uh, what part of what they're doing today, you know, with the DNA and stuff, and how they want to, they don't want to just long elongate their lives, you know, their lifespans and stuff on, on in this realm, and and to make this experience permanent for the vessels that are here that they use. Okay, but they want to be able to connect. They want to be able to elevate the mind and and uh, and and use these faculties in a more permanent essence, and basically be able to tap into into these things, uh, such as the cosmic consciousness or the the database, um, whenever they want, at at their will. Instead of you know people go through years and years of training and meditation and studies and practices others just get blessed uh, you know if you're blessed with the Holy Spirit then you're blessed with the Holy Spirit um, but when I get into that I thank you for joining me for this book it was an excellent read and I will see you next time